Gen X is set to be the wealthiest ever to have lived, thanks to the phenomenon known as the Great Wealth Transfer. A study by Research House McCrindle estimates this generation will inherit the colossal figure of three and a half trillion from their parents over the next 20 years. But what are the top three mistakes people make when leaving wealth? Max Phelps from Golden Eggs joins me now in the studio too. Uh, welcome, Max. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so you have an amazing story in terms of just how you created your wealth, and it's just a, it's a good launch pad before we get into some questions. Maybe you could just sure. Share it's it. amazing to see that three and a half million trillion tr yeah. wealth transfer. I grew up in a family of nine children with uh, very little money, so and I've unfortunately already received my eighty thousand dollar inheritance. Um, and that was it. That's, that's all I expected to receive. So I, I had to start from scratch. Um, I did do okay for a while working with a big company, bought a family home, sold a family home, and started buying property, especially in America. I bought a whole bunch of units in, in the, uh, Arizona, had properties in the UK, and I've got properties now in Queensland and WA, as well as Sydney over here. So I've been very fortunate in kind of coming from very little to being in a very comfortable position now and now starting to try and help my uh, kids get in a better position themselves. Okay, just the concept of selling the family home and buying all these investment <laughs> properties, particularly when you're looking at changing geographic locations, because you are taking currency risk and uh, not sovereign risk, obviously, but other risks, they're different jurisdictions. They're not necessarily, well, the UK you might know, but maybe not the US. So um, maybe what was the, was it just purely geographic diversification to build up the asset base that drove you to go offshore as well as at home? Well, there was a number of things there. You mentioned currency risk. Well, the dollar was parity with the mm. US dollar when I bought, which was very unusual. Mm. Um, the second thing is their market over there had been absolutely smashed. So we're talking post-GFC. Post-GFC, yeah. 2011, mm. prices were 75% down. Um, and the third thing is just, like you say, geographic uh, diversification. I, I, my wife and I love to travel, and so having money to be able to travel was important for us. And therefore, having a, a US dollar income was a was a good thing, as well as a UK. We actually lived in the UK for a couple of years before we bought uh, one, when we bought over there. Okay, so let's let's work now down to um, helping one's kids out. What are the, some of the things that you advocate um, in your role as, let's say, a mortgage broker in the finance arena of what uh, parents could be doing potentially with their kids? Well, well the first thing is I, I often come across parents that are helping their kids. And one example I can think of is uh, Ravi was looking for a place for his son who's a doctor, too busy to find a place. And I said, oh, you're helping your son, that's really good. Um, are you helping him financially? He said, oh yeah, we're gonna gift him the deposit. I said, gifting him the deposit? Mm. When you gift your kids a deposit, the problem with that is you're potentially giving away half of that to a stranger. Mm -hmm. Because kids often get in relationships, get married, split up, then half of that's gone. The second thing is he was looking for an apartment which probably would be an investment property in the future. So, so there's better options than just giving the money away to your kids. Um, and so that's one of the, the mistakes that we try and help people avoid. Uh, and a better option to that would be to uh, lend the money. Mm. Now a loan is still the same money, mm. but now it's a loan means I expect it back. And if the yeah. relationship goes sour, I want it back. Also means that if that property becomes an investment in the future, we can refinance that debt to pay mum or dad back. Mum or dad can then gift that again to the kids to buy the family home. Mm -hmm. So it puts them in a much better position than just, uh, just gift, uh, giving the money away. Absolutely. What are some of the other aspects in terms of uh, ways to hold properties? Um, I didn't touch on my former guests, but you know, there are options out there. Yeah, and so it's quite surprising. Everyone thinks you have to buy the property in your name, and absolutely that's not true. And so I actually don't own any property in Australia in my name. Um, I've got about five or six different trusts that all own different properties. And owning property through trusts, for me, is a great way to transfer wealth to my kids when I die. Um, I've been obsessed with dying for, since I was uh, very young. Um, but I assume it's going to happen at one stage, but a trust will outlive me. A trust has at least an 80-year life, and so I can then uh, help my kids to carry on owning my assets without having to sell them to split them up. 
So the trust, um, without getting too technical, buys the property, the mm -hmm. income generated from the property goes into the trust and then is it distributed to the yeah. beneficiaries, just broadly speaking? Correct, yeah. So and, and of course, a discretionary trust, you have the discretion as to who to get the benefit in any given year. And obviously, while you're alive, you might choose to take that money to yourselves. And of course, after you go, then, then that money can be just distributed equally between kids without the asset having to be the property being sold. And are they expensive to set up for, for the average person if they just wanted to buy, you know, a small investment property, maybe not in one of the, you know, central cities or something? Is that a viable option? Uh, it all depends. We always recommend getting advice from an accountant and, yeah. and always set your first one up. I, I paid an accountant, I set, my, set up my first one. Usually costs between one and $2,000 to set up. And then you've got about usually five, $600 worth of annual fees to pay ASIC and, and pay an accountant. So they're not really that expensive. Uh, a lot of people, there are some people, of course, that will try and charge you $10,000 to set them up and $5,000 a year, but, but shop around. Um, I actually set up a trust for my, my son yesterday. Mm -hmm. So he just, just bought a house yesterday, uh, his second place, or technically third, um, through a trust. And uh, there's kits online that you can do. You have to know what you're doing. And obviously I know what I'm doing. I can't do it for other people. Accountants, solicitors can. but you can download one off the internet for like 200 bucks. Right, right. Set up a company with ASIC for 600 bucks. So they're not really that expensive to set up. So I suppose, as always, this isn't financial advice. No. Um, you know, go and seek from the experts. But nevertheless, uh, you know, we're talking about good ideas. Just in terms of bringing your kids into the fold, are there different ways that you can, apart from saying like, you know, we've set up the trust for you and we're going to lend you some money and et cetera, et cetera. How do they become actually more actively involved in the process? Yeah, so again, when we, in terms of seeing, the, when we see clients in our business, often they'll start off wanting to gift and then we say that's not a great idea. They'll say they want to buy a place together with their kids. That again causes headaches down the track when you want to unwind and get a parent out and you want to pay stamp duty again. And then uh, another option is just to buy everything in your name as a parent and that makes it very difficult to then go, oh, well, it's for my kids, but it's, it's mine. Mm. Legally, it's mine. That mm. causes a headache. Whereas what I found with my eldest son, who was good at saving, ready to buy, is we did a small lot subdivision, and it's one of the best things we ever did. We bought a house on a big block of land, knocked down the house, built two houses, okay? Now, one of those houses was put in a trust in his name, and one of those houses was put in a trust in our names. Now, we're all cross beneficiaries of each other, but he is now responsible for that trust. He's the director of that trust, and he's had to gradually learn that. And so when we set up a another trust for him yesterday, um, he already knows the process, he already knows what he needs to do, he's familiar with it, he was able to make the buying decision himself, and in fact he's bought a property that he can subdivide himself now um, in his own trust. And he only got that through kind of partnering with us to start with, and now go on, out on his own. And, and it's, it's how you teach kids everything really, is if you know, you le they learn by doing, and if they do it with you, then they'll be ready to do it on their own later. Oh, absolutely, Max. Well, thank you so much for joining Ausbiz and The Wealthy Effect this afternoon. It's been great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for having me and uh, look forward to uh, maybe being on again and talking more about Golden Eggs, the business. Indeed.